Um, at the outset, I want to acknowledge the role that my former colleague, Minister Catherine Sapone, played uh, in supporting the Commission throughout her term of office, which was not easy at times, and most importantly, through her engagement in a respectful manner uh, with the survivors and their families. History will show that the independent ministers in the last government fought against the systemic bias uh, of sweeping issues under the carpet uh, and just hoping that they would go away. And at least in part, this was the reason why uh, we've ended up with the uh, institutions such as mother and baby homes and many more institutional scandals, which are at the very least were known to uh, official Ireland, but were at best just ignored and swept uh, under that very same carpet. The Commission report has provided new information and in the case of the vaccine trials provided some answers uh, to the children as well as raising many, many others. I want to put uh, on record uh, for those who criticise the work of the Commission that it has provided information and hopefully secured documentation that firstly the state had conveniently brushed under that carpet by turning a blind eye to the failure to comply with the most rudimentary standards uh, for vaccine trials. And secondly, the state had so willingly returned personal medical documentation uh, in the past without considering the implications for the people, then innocent children involved. And the Ryan Commission records of the vaccine trials were returned by the state to the congregations nearly a decade ago without giving access to the individuals who had been impacted by it. While the Commission has reviewed the medical records available to it and concluded that there was no evidence uh, of injury to the children involved uh, in the vaccine trials, but I believe that such a conclusion is simplistic. Firstly, these children were treated as little more than human pincushions by the companies and the clinicians involved due to the large number of injections uh, they received and the blood samples that were actually taken. How can we be sure that there were no delayed immunological impacts of these particular formulations if no guardian was in a position to tell the clinician treating that child after the end of the trial that they had received an experimental formulation previously, or that the child as an adult was in a position to inform their treating doctor that they were involved in an experimental trial. Each of these children need to be contacted and need to be provided with the medical records, and these combined with their own medical history needs to be independently reviewed, and a report uh, in full uh, and fully transparently published on the conclusions of that. This should happen immediately, and the full cost must be borne by GlaxoSmithKline. The Commission did, however, uh, flag the issue of consent and the failure to secure that. And why is the issue of consent so important? Primarily, we all have a basic human right uh, of our own bodily integrity and the need for informed consent in advance of any medical study. This was not sought despite it being the legal and regulatory requirement at the time. Secondly, without engaging with the parent or guardian of the children, the clinician could not deem uh, the children to be suitable for inclusion in any trial. For example, paragraph 34.121 on the 1968-69 measles vaccine trial states that the trial should have excluded children with a personal or strong family history of convulsions or allergy, asthma or eczema. Without consent, how could this have been ascertained in relation to these children? And consent was a standard procedure, at least in some of the homes, uh, for vaccinations outside of clinical trials at that point in time. Paragraph 34.71 states that the Dunboyne Institute records contain complete written consent forms relating to instances where infants uh, residing there had been presented for immunisation at public health clinics. These consent forms were signed either by the mother or by the matron. But 
there was no consent forms available for the clinical trials. It was also clear from the report that the Department of Health had serious problems uh, with uh, the use of children in these homes for clinical trials, similar to the concerns uh, in the UK. However, paragraph 34.92 uh, states that a Department of Health document uh, from the 30 December, December, September 1963, dealing with the application, noted that in April 1962, Professor Meehan had asked uh, to field trial an, trial an oral polio vaccine in Pellettstown. In that instance, it was noted that the Department of Health had no objection to the trial itself being, uh, but raised concerns regarding the selection of Pellettstown. And it referenced the, the Department report which said, while the procedures proposed appeared to be safe, safe ones, the selection of a group to participate uh, was open to objection and approval was not given on that occasion. So the department did not want clinical trials being carried out on children in homes. But it didn't seem to make any difference to the clinicians involved whether the department consent or not, because paragraph 34.163, uh, uh, where permission was sought in relation to the oral polio vaccine in Pellettstown, Permission was refused. However, the Commission goes on to state that it takes the view that there was a high probability that pellet sound was in fact actually used uh, in the trial despite the refusal from the Department. And do GlaxoSmithKline have a lot of questions uh, to answer? Why did the scientific publications on uh, UK and Nigerian trials specifically make reference to consent, yet these references to consent were conveniently left out of the very same trial publications based on Irish children. Why was Ireland seen as a soft option uh, for trials involving children uh, in institutions? Clearly such trials could not take place uh, in the UK and neither uh, would that have been the case in Ireland, based on the regulatory and legal system that was in place at the time. But because of a lack of enforcement in Ireland, they were happy to proceed. Paragraph 34.122 uh, states, on the 5th of September 1968, Dr. Coffey told uh, Dr. Berglund uh, from Galaxo Laboratories that she had come up against the usual complications while trying to engage uh, in a field trial uh, of Galaxo's uh, measles vaccine in Dublin. The response from Galaxo was very interesting. Dr. Berglund advised Dr. Coffey to liaise with Dr. Hillary uh, as she may be able to suggest a way in which you could overcome the problems that you have uh, encountered. In other words, a way to get around the law of the land and get around the refusal of the Department of Health to actually uh, sanction these. GlaxoSmithKline need to answer why, if these were, um, uh, if these were, uh, if these formulations were not placed on the market, why were they not placed uh, on the market on a commercial basis? basis? Was it because they were not effective uh, in actually uh, preventing the diseases uh, that they were supposed to? And if that was the case, that would have in impacted on the subsequent immunity of the children involved in these studies. Were children outside of homes, either in Ireland or the UK, subjected to the battery of needles that the children in these homes were subjected to. Multiple administration of vaccine doses, multiple blood sampling uh, procedures taking place. There must now be, as a matter of urgency, an engagement on behalf of these children who were involved in these trials with GlaxoSmithKline, who as a very first step must provide an unequivocal apology and clear and forthright answers, as well as putting a financial support package in place for those exploited uh, 
uh, exploited by ignoring their basic fundamental right of bodily integrity. GlaxoSmithKline financially benefited from this research and they were happy enough to ensure that those who conducted these trials uh, also benefited from it and they need now to live up to their responsibilities to the victims as well. And there was a clear benefit for the clinicians involved in these particular trials. Firstly, uh, there was direct payments that are referenced. At the very least, funding was provided towards research facilities would, which would assist those researchers in securing scientific publications. Many of the researchers were also involved in scientific public publications which helped them secure promotions and status within their own scientific community and it would also have been a benefit to the universities uh, involved. And we now need to see an apology from the two universities involved, namely UCD and uh, Trinity College. But it's also important to point out that these scientific publications were peer-reviewed in advance of publication in the British Medical Journal and the Lancet. Lancet. Interestingly, publications of the British trials include an outline of consent and confirmation that consent was obtained in line with the law and ethical standards, but not when it came to the publication of the Irish studies. Why was this not set as a precondition of publication. It should have been. If it had been and uh, the academics were shown that they must provide that, maybe then those particular children would not have been exploited and those institutions would not have been used again and again. So we need to see an explanation as to why this didn't happen and an apology from both the British Medical Journal and The Lancet. But as I said at the start, uh, there was a cover-up right to the top, a brush under the carpet attitude and that it will go away. And if we look at paragraph 34.153, the Department of Health had flagged it in 1968 that Professor Meehan was carrying out uh, vaccine trials without the authorisation of the Minister for Health. Minister, there are a lot of questions here and we need to see the victims supported to get answers, answers right across the board and apologies. Thank you. Thank